Well, discouragement can be deadly. It can wreck lives and destroy dreams. John Toole was a young man who wrote a book shortly after he got out of the army. John thought his writing had some promise, and so he shopped it around to various publishers. But like most budding authors, he got uh, nothing but rejection letter after rejection letter. But his dream to become a writer kept him going. However, the continual stream of rejections eventually took their toll, and John finally gave up. But his mom never did. She kept shopping his book around from publisher to publisher, but she had no better luck than her son. Then one day, she read about a particular author who was becoming a professor at Loyola University, New Orleans. My son wrote a book based in New Orleans, she said as she pushed her way into his office. Maybe since you're a writer, you read it and like it. Well, he agreed to read the manuscript, and when he did, he loved it, and soon sold it to the Louisiana State University Press. That manuscript would become a bestseller on 10 different lists, and in 1981, John Toole's book, A Confederacy of Dunces, won the Pulitzer Prize for fiction. John was not able to receive the award. His mother received it for him because the sting of rejection led him to give up on more than just his dream. He also gave up on life, ending his own about a decade before his book would surpass his wildest imagination. Discouragement wrecks lives and destroys dreams. When we left Elijah last week, he was overwhelmed by discouragement and fear. He had fled into the wilderness and was praying that God would end his life. In Elijah's mind, a drastic change had occurred in his circumstances. Let me explain. Three and a half years earlier, Elijah had watched God close the heavens, fulfilling a prophecy of judgment against Israel for her sin of idolatry. And now, three and a half years later, God had displayed his magnificent power again, this time sending fire down on Mount Carmel. The people had bowed to the ground in fear and in, in humble submission and reverential fear. They cried out, the Lord, he is God. And the false prophets had been executed and God had answered Elijah's prayer, finally sending rain and ending the drought. And in all of this, Elijah had expected a great revival to sweep through the land, beginning in the palace. Elijah had hoped that God would bless his ministry efforts and use him to turn the hearts of the people back to the Lord in ways that his ancestors had never achieved. But, but the arrival of Jezebel's messenger changed Elijah's perspective on all of this. The messenger confirmed that the hearts of the royal couple were as far from God as they had ever been. And in Elijah's mind, in Elijah's mind, his efforts and prayers over the last three and a half years seem to have yielded exactly nothing. Fruitless. Empty. Wasted. Elijah felt like his entire ministry had failed completely, and he was just not prepared to handle that. The best thing then in his mind would be then to die. At least then he might find some relief or rest from the fruitless toil and the hopeless conflict. And so we ended last Sunday's sermon in verse 5 of chapter 19, and it said, and then he laid down under the tree and fell asleep. Elijah had hit his limit, physically, emotionally, spiritually, vocationally. He just didn't have it in him to take another step or to face another threat or even to live another day. He was just done. And he prayed that the Lord 
would take his life. And then, utterly exhausted, he fell asleep. And you know, Elijah's predicament is common to all of us. Now, our experience may not be quite as intense as his was, but all of us have experienced, to one degree or another, lonely hours, disappointing days, moments of feeling swallowed up by hopelessness, times when our tireless efforts have seemed fruitless, and times when our sincere motives have been misunderstood. We have all faced discouragement. And so today we're going to pick up right where we left off in verse 5, because I want us all to see how the Lord responded to Elijah's discouragement and fear for two specific reasons. First, I want us to see how the Lord responded so that when we bring our fear and discouragement to the Lord, we can be confident in how the Lord will respond to us based on how he responded to Elijah. And second, this passage can also give us a clearer picture of how to respond when people around us are facing discouragement and fear so that we might ease their burden a bit and not make it heavier. So let's walk through this passage together and see what the Lord would want to teach us this morning. In verses 5 through 8, we find that Elijah is refreshed. He's, he's refreshed with food and sleep. Look at these verses with me. It says, Then he lay down under the tree and fell asleep. All at once an angel touched him and said, Get up and eat. He looked around, and there by his head was a cake of bread baked over hot coals and a jar of water. He ate and drank and then lay down again. And the angel of the Lord came back a second time and touched him and said, Get up and eat, for the journey is too much for you. So he got up and ate and drank, and strengthened by that food, he traveled 40 days and 40 nights until he reached Horeb, the mountain of God. Let's pause there. So when we left Elijah, he had fallen asleep under a broom tree, or what some of your Bibles might call a juniper tree. We have a picture of one of those here on the screen. Now, Elijah laid down underneath that, and he was physically exhausted and emotionally depleted, and he asked God to take his life. Vance Havner once said, if a person doesn't come apart and rest once in a while, he will simply come apart. And Elijah was simply coming apart. And at this fragile point in Elijah's uh, ministry and journey, God responded with compassion and great understanding. Psalm 103 reminds us that as a good father has compassion on his children, so the Lord has compassion on those who fear him. For he knows how we are formed. He remembers that we are dust. And so with patient grace, God sat back and just allowed Elijah to sleep. Just let him sleep. And we don't know for how long, though I suspect he slept long and deep. Elijah was eventually awakened by an angel who provided a cake of bread and a jar of water. And the angel thoughtfully placed them near Elijah's head so that in his exhaustion, Elijah would not even have to move much in order to reach them. And his words to Elijah, get up and eat, were spoken quietly and gently, I believe. And it's important to notice here that the Lord in this moment did not rebuke Elijah. The angel didn't say, get up and start praying, you know, or get up, serve, do something. Or get up, it's time to read your Bible. You know, and this reminds us that sometimes discouragement is best addressed by tending to a person's physical needs first. This was the Lord's approach with Elijah. He simply allowed him to sleep and eat and then go back to sleep again. Sometimes the most spiritual thing you can do is take a nap. That's really true. Now, the food provided by the angel 
was the same food that God had provided to Elijah through the widow at Zarephath. Remember, it was a cake of bread and some water. And I think in a small way, God was just reminding Elijah that just as he had faithfully provided in the past, first at the ravine and then with the, at the widow's home in Zarephath, just as God had faithfully provided in the past, so he would faithfully provide for Elijah in the days ahead. Elijah ate what the angel had provided and then laid back down and fell asleep. And all the while, God was right there, tenderly, lovingly watching over his worn-out prophet. And after sufficient rest, the Lord sent the angel back to wake Elijah up again and to provide him with a second meal. And God's tenderness towards his children is so evident in these verses. Elijah had pushed himself hard to the point of a crash, really. But God was gentle with him. God was patient with him. Instead of taking Elijah's life as Elijah requested, God provided him with some food and sleep. And the angel's word to Elijah, where he says, the journey is too much for you. This is a reminder for us that our journey through life is too much for us. Our journey is too much for us. Our journey through life in a fallen and sinful world is difficult and painful and unpredictable and at times overwhelming. We need the Lord, friends. We can't do this journey on our own. I can't speak for any of you, but as for me, I need the Lord every single day. My journey is too much for me. It's too much. And I need his strength and his guidance, and his encouragement and his reassurance every single day. And I find them when I'm in God's presence, when I am in his word, when I am in worship and when I am in fellowship with all of you. And I cannot encourage you strongly enough to spend time with the Lord every single day. Every day, spend time with Him. For apart from Him, apart from Him, the journey is too difficult for us. We can't make it on our own. Now verse 8 concludes by saying that strengthened by this food, Elijah then traveled 40 days and 40 nights until he reached Mount Horeb, or the mountain of God. Now, if Mount Horeb is not familiar to you, you might know this mountain by its other name, which is Mount Sinai. This is the mountain where God appeared to Moses in a burning bush. This is where Moses was allowed to see the glory of the Lord after the Lord had passed by. This is where Moses had ascended the mountain into the presence of the Lord to receive the law, the Ten Commandments. Mount Sinai, Mount Horeb, it's the same mountain. Now, Mount Horeb was an additional 200 or so miles south of where Elijah was in the wilderness. And so wanting to stay out of sight from those who were hunting him, Elijah would have traveled more cautiously, more slowly, probably only traveling at night. And thus the trip took significantly longer than it probably would have for other travelers. It took him 40 days and 40 nights. But in verse 9, Elijah finally arrives at the mountain and he finds a cave and he goes inside the cave to spend the night. And then the next morning, kind of the next chapter begins. And in these next several verses, Elijah is questioned. Elijah is questioned by the Lord. The Lord has refreshed Elijah with food and some sleep and he's provided protection as he made his journey across the wilderness. But now the Lord is going to graciously invite Elijah to reflect on and discuss the concerns on his mind. So look at verse 9 with me. It says, There he went into a cave and spent the night, and then the word of the Lord came to him. What are you doing here, Elijah? You know, God's approach to counseling his people is just unsurpassed. It is filled with wisdom and tenderness. God is slow to anger and abounding in love. He knows our backgrounds and our experiences. He understands our pain, our fear, our plans, and our dreams. He knows our strengths 
and our limitations. He knows our vulnerabilities. He knows all that's going on in our minds and hearts, even before we do. And so God began by meeting Elijah's physical needs for sleep and food. And when his physical needs were met, God asked Elijah a question. He was inviting Elijah to take a closer look at his inner world. What's going on in your heart, Elijah? And so the Lord asks him, what are you doing here, Elijah? A couple of things to understand about this question. Two things. First, the question is not asked in frustration and anger, which is sometimes how we read it. The Lord is not saying, what in the world are you doing here? What's the matter with you? That's not what's going on here. God knew Elijah's heart. And he knew that Elijah was vitally concerned about the honor of the Lord among his people. And and Elijah was very concerned about the nation of Israel and God's plans for his people. So the Lord did not ask this question in anger. He understood Elijah's heart. But second, the Lord was not asking because he was surprised and looking for information. What are you doing here? <laughs> you know, it's not that, and it's not like the Lord was confused and looking for clarification. The Lord knows all things, and he knew what was going on in Elijah's heart even better than Elijah did. And so he asked the question for Elijah's benefit. You know, he asked that question so Elijah would be invited lovingly to talk. Tell me what's on your mind, son. Tell me about the despair you feel. Talk to me about this desire you have to give up. Why do you want it to all be over? I think Elijah came to the mountain with the intention of trying to resign from his calling as a prophet. Remember in verse 4, he said, I have had enough. I'm done. But the Lord knew Elijah's deeper issue centered around fear and discouragement and maybe some disillusionment. And so the Lord invited Elijah to talk about that. Talk about what's on your heart. And so Elijah replied in verse 10, Look at this. He says, I have been very zealous for the Lord God Almighty. The Israelites have rejected your covenant, broken down your altars, put your prophets to death with the sword. I am the only one left, and now they're trying to kill me too. See, Elijah's answer was direct and straightforward, and everything he said was true, at least from his limited perspective. It was true in his limited perspective. Elijah has been very zealous for the Lord. He has. The word zealous means to be fervent, to be exclusively devoted to something. And Elijah has been exclusively devoted to the calling and purposes of God. No question about that. Elijah was not only enthusiastically committed to God above all other gods, but he was zealous For the first two commandments, which Ahab had broken brazenly, the first two commandments which said, for God alone is to be worshipped, and idolatry is to be rejected. Elijah had been very zealous for those. But beyond that, the Israelites had rejected the Lord's covenant, and they had turned to idols. And the Lord's altars had been torn down. Remember, Elijah on Mount Carmel had to rebuild the altar of the Lord before he could make his sacrifice. And the prophets of the Lord had been killed. Ahab and Jezebel had been ruthless and tireless in their efforts to wipe out the prophets of the Lord. All of this was true. And, but the depth of Elijah's despair is felt when he utters these words. I am the only one left, and now they're trying to kill me too. Discouragement is twisting his perspective a bit. Yes, he had stood alone on Mount Carmel. That's true. And Obadiah had a hundred prophets hidden in two caves, but none of them, none of them had stepped forward to stand by Elijah's side when he stood against the 850 prophets of Baal. And now Jezebel has put a hit out on Elijah, seeking to kill him too. That was true. That was true. But, but 
the Lord had faithfully protected Elijah during those previous three and a half years, and there was no reason to think that the Lord could not or would not protect him now. Elijah was discouraged and isolated, and this was distorting his reality. And when he had finished giving his answer, the Lord did not rebuke him. He didn't correct him. He didn't say, what's the matter with you, Elijah? I expected more than this from you. He also did not minimize Elijah's concerns. Man, you are making way more of this than what's really needed. Kind of turning a mountain into a, you know, a molehill into a, uh, how am I saying that wrong? <laughs> You're making it bigger than it needs to be, Elijah. And he doesn't dismiss Elijah's concern. He doesn't say, snap out of it, Elijah, move on. Get your act together. And he doesn't spiritualize Elijah's concern, saying, you know, this really doesn't look very good for followers of mine to have these kinds of doubts and feelings. It's not going to be good for your testimony. God doesn't respond in any of those ways to Elijah which just, again, is a reminder for us, for you and me, that we should not respond to another person's discouragement by rebuking, minimizing, dismissing, or spiritualizing what's on their heart. A person's perspective may need to be corrected or even adjusted a little bit, but those responses, that's not the way to do it. Those responses create a sense of shame and a desire to withdraw away from relationship. A better approach is to try to focus on two things. When somebody around you is discouraged, it's better to try and focus on two things. First, what thoughts or ideas are prominent in your mind when you're discouraged? What ideas or thoughts are prominent in your mind? Identify them as crisply as you can and determine whether or not they are true. Because most of the time, the discouraging voices in our head are lying to us. They are twisting things. They are distorting reality. And if we can pinpoint that, we can shut it down. Second, try to focus on what's the next step you could realistically take towards a solution. What's the next step you could realistically take? Because when discouraged, what happens is we often focus our, our frustrations on the things that are really out of our control, things that we have no power over. And that just leaves us feeling helpless, like there's nothing we can do. We're just stuck. Focus instead on a realistic next step you can take towards a solution, even if it's a small step. Is there a phone call you can make? Is there somebody you can have coffee with? Is there a question you need to research? Is there a book you could read or an article you could read or a blog you could listen to? Is there an assignment to finish? We eat an elephant the same way we eat everything else, friends. One bite at a time, right? And usually, Taking one step towards a solution will help us to take a next step, and then a third step, and maybe a fourth step. Now watch and look at and see how the Lord does this with Elijah in the cave. In Elijah's case, the Lord invites Elijah just to come out of the cave. Just take that next step. Just come out of the cave. Do not stay entombed in that cave, Elijah, with your discouragement and despair. One author said, you never drown by going under the water, you drown by staying there, right? So the Lord called Elijah, just take one step, just come out of the cave, breathe fresher air, see a grander vision, Elijah. Look at verses 11 and 12. The Lord said, go out and stand on the mountain in the presence of the Lord, for the Lord is about to pass by. And then a great and powerful wind tore the mountains apart and shattered the rocks before the Lord. But the Lord was not in the wind. And after the wind, there was an earthquake. But the Lord was not in the earthquake. And after the earthquake came a fire. 
But the Lord was not in the fire. And after the fire came a gentle whisper. So the Lord said, take this next step. Go out and stand in the presence of the Lord. See, discouragement and fear had taken Elijah's eyes off of the Lord. He was focused entirely on the circumstances around him. Elijah had been praying fervently and serving the Lord. And when he confronted the prophets of Baal on Mount Carmel, and when he exposed Baal as a false god, nothing more than a piece of wood that's been carved by human hands, he fully expected a revival to sweep the land, sweep through Israel, complete with confession and repentance, starting with the royal couple in the palace. Elijah was expecting something big and dramatic to happen. I mean, after all, the power and presence of God should always appear in sensational and cataclysmic ways, right? No. Well, now Elijah has been called to come out of the cave, for the Lord was about to pass by. And so a great and powerful wind tore the mountains, shattered the rocks, and after the wind there was an earthquake, and after the earthquake there was a fire, but the Lord was not in the wind or the earthquake or the fire. And the wind, earthquake, and fire were all well-known signs of God's presence. They had been seen on Mount Sinai before with Moses. But God was not in any of those upheavals this time. And we understand then that God is not limited to dramatic and terrifying displays of power. God can just as easily and effectively work in quiet, subtle, and even hidden ways. Elijah was only looking for the dramatic, only looking for big and sensational, which means he was overlooking everything else. And he was getting discouraged as a result. Verse 12 says, After the fire came a gentle whisper. The King James Version translates this, A still small voice, which is probably the phrase that most of us are familiar with, right? And here's what's important about that little phrase. Never before had God shown up like this. Never before had God's voice been heard as, as a soft and gentle whisper. In Psalm 29, which I read for you at the beginning of the service, King David had described the Lord's voice as powerful and majestic, breaking the cedars of Lebanon, striking with flashes of lightning, shaking the desert, twisting the oaks, and stripping the forest bare. But now, but now, with Elijah on the side of the mountain, the Lord has revealed himself in a new way to Elijah. And he shows himself to be a God who can speak and act powerfully in a soft and gentle manner. Now look at verses 13 and 14. When Elijah heard it, when he heard this gentle whisper, he pulled his cloak over his face and went out and stood at the mouth of the cave. Then a voice said to him, What are you doing here, Elijah? And he replied, I have been very zealous for the Lord God Almighty. The Israelites have rejected your covenant and broken down your altars and your prophets uh, and put your prophets to death with the sword. And I am the only one left. And now they're trying to kill me too. The text does not explicitly say that the Lord was in the whisper, but he clearly was. Because as soon as Elijah heard it, he went and stood at the entrance to the cave. God was now ready to speak again with his servant. And Elijah, it says, he covered his face with his cloak, hiding his face. This was a show of reverence in the presence of the Lord. And so Elijah is questioned a second time, and the Lord asks him the exact same question. And interestingly, Elijah gives the exact same answer. And I think what this shows us is that he did not understand the point that God was trying to make with the wind and earthquake and fire. Elijah just didn't, under, he just didn't understand it yet. Elijah was still looking for God to bring revival in a spine-tingling, heart-thumping display of power. 
Elijah was defining ministry success in terms of pulse-pounding, head-turning results. And so Elijah still wasn't getting it. And so to overcome Elijah's discouragement and fear, God redefined ministry success for him. He gave Elijah three very specific assignments, telling Elijah, just be faithful to complete these three tasks and leave the larger results in my hands. Elijah, all I want you to do is just complete these three assignments and leave the larger results to me. Look at verses 15 to 17. It says, The Lord said to him, Go back the way you came and go to the desert of Damascus. And when you get there, anoint Hazael king over Aram. Also, anoint Jehu, son of Nimshi, king over Israel, and anoint Elisha, son of Shaphat, from Abel Meholah, to succeed you as prophet. Jehu will put to death any who escape the sword of Hazael, and Elisha will put to death any who escape the sword of Jehu. And in these final few verses, Elijah is recommissioned. He's recommissioned. God gives him a new assignment. Elijah may have come to the mountain intent on resigning, thinking, he's done. I've had enough. But God still had work for Elijah to do. And he leaves the mountain with a new assignment, called again to re-enter the battle against Baal. But first, but first, he must go back the way he came. Go back the way you came and go to the desert of Damascus. Go back through the wilderness, back through Beersheba, back through Jezreel. God was sending Elijah back into Jezebel's land because Elijah had to face his fear. God had faithfully protected him for three and a half years against those who wanted him. So Elijah must now face his fear of Jezebel and trust the Lord to watch over him there. So from and then from Jezreel, he was to travel about a hundred miles further north to the desert of Damascus. And with this assignment, no longer would Elijah be working by himself to eradicate the worship of Baal. He was sent back with a specific task of enlisting three specific people. And through those three men, the worship of Baal would be eliminated. Elijah was to make sure that a man named Hazael was anointed king over Aram. Now, this would be dangerous. Hazael was not a member of the royal family in Syria, which means that Elijah could be inciting a revolution in a foreign country that would not go well with the existing king. And Hazael was a wicked man. Second, he was to make sure that Jehu was anointed king over Israel. This would also require significant risk-taking on Elijah's part because Jehu was also not a member of the royal family in Israel. So clearly, Ahab would see this as treason. And third, Elijah was to anoint Elisha as prophet, as his successor. So God gave him these three specific assignments. Go find these three people. And then, having given Elijah these assignments, God graciously kind of explained what would happen through these three men so that Elijah would have kind of a sense of the bigger picture. God was going to eliminate Baal worship, as Elijah had hoped. But God was not going to do it in the way that Elijah had expected. It would not happen with the prophet calling the nation to repent and then God sending a dramatic display of power to convince them. Rather, it would come more subtly as Ahab's family and Baal worshipers were eliminated. And this would happen through the unlikely combination of a pagan king in Syria, a new dynasty in Israel, and a next generation prophet. And when God explained all of this, 
I think Elijah finally began to understand the lesson of the wind, earthquake, fire, and whisper on the side of the mountain. I think it started to make sense to him. Baal worship would be eradicated, but not through explosive and dramatic displays of power, but rather through quieter, more subtle means. Elijah would begin the process. Others would finish it. And the Lord overcame Elijah's discouragement by giving him this new, broader perspective on what was going to happen and how, what success would look like. Friends, this is an important reminder for us. With God, bigger is not always better. Bigger is not always better. God does not always work in sensational and overwhelming ways. And sometimes, sometimes God is not even in those dramatic displays. Sometimes he's not in that at all. Now, of course, God can choose to show his presence in big ways if he wants to. He did that on Mount Carmel with the fire coming down. God can do that. But to insist that God's work in our ministry must always show up as bigger, more elaborate, more spectacular than than before, that's just simply not the way God always works. God doesn't always operate in the realm of the sensational. Sometimes God chooses to work in quiet, subtle, and even hidden ways. That was the lesson for Elijah that day. And Elijah now understood, I think, that he was not the only link in this chain of events. There were other links in this chain of events besides him, and now he could name at least three others. And success in ministry would not be defined by big and explosive and dramatic Success would now be defined as being faithful to complete the assignments he had been given. Elijah needed to have his expectations adjusted so that he could learn to see clearly God's hand at work. And God gently and patiently did that work in Elijah. So now Elijah is able to rejoice in God's big displays of power but he can also recognize and celebrate God's quieter, more subtle victories. Discouragement can be deadly. It can wreck lives and shatter dreams. And just to encourage Elijah one step further, God reminded Elijah that he was not alone. He had never been alone. Look at verse 18 says, yet I reserve 7,000 in Israel, all whose knees have not bowed down to Baal, and all whose mouths have not kissed him. There were still 7,000 in Israel loyal to Yahweh. In a way, in a way, God was saying to Elijah, your life has not been wasted, son. Your life's not been wasted. It's not been fruitless. Your your ministry efforts haven't been fruitless and vain. I began a good work in you, making you faithful and courageous. And then I used that faithfulness and courage over the last three and a half years to inspire and motivate 7,000 other people to stay loyal to me and not to bow down to Baal. You inspired them. You encouraged them. So stay strong, Elijah. I will be faithful to complete the work I started in you. And there's more kingdom work I need you to accomplish. So keep serving. Complete each task that I give you. And leave the larger results to me. I won't let you down. I won't let you down. Let's pray. And then the worship team will come and lead us in our final song. Heavenly Father, we thank you this morning for this particular look into Elijah's life. Thanks for letting us see that even a guy like Elijah could struggle with discouragement and fear. And God, we thank you for your response to Elijah, that it was so gracious and so patient. Your compassion lets us know that you will do the same for us, and we're so 
encouraged by that. Lord, help us to keep our eyes focused on you so that we are not overwhelmed by the immediate circumstances confronting us. Help us to be faithful to the calling and assignments that you've given to us. Help us to wait upon you, spending time with you each day so that we might mount up with wings as eagles, so that we might run and not get weary, walk and not faint. God, I pray that you would help us to be encouragers, breathing life and joy into people around us. And may you use those relationships to give us opportunities to tell others about you. God, we want our lives to point people to you so that your name is praised and honored and worshiped and lifted up as you so rightly deserve. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Mm.